On this week's show, Liz goes behind the scenes of IVF treatment. To think that that just there is potentially the beginning of a brand new life. Incredible. Dr. Yan is out on the streets worrying shoppers. All I'd like you to do actually is pass me that sweet. Oh my God! <laughs> and Jem attempts to become the first man ever to go 360 degrees on a playground swing. I think it's the most dangerous thing that nobody's ever done. That's Bang Goes the Theory, oh, no. revealing your world with a bang. Welcome to Bang Goes the Theory. First up on the show, Mr. Jem Stansfield is regressing back to his childhood and having a go on the swings. Don't anyone ever try this. Everybody knows somebody who reckons that their cousin's best mate's brother once knew somebody who went all the way around on a swing. Fact is, I don't think it's ever actually happened. Not on a real swing, with chains, anyway. There's just too many things that stack up against it. Let's see. I can just about push an empty swing over, but add 75 kilos of fully grown man and a quick calculation shows you'd need a shove force of nearly a ton to get round. You'd have to have the biggest big brother ever. So what I want to do is, with a normal park swing, see what it would take to make it actually happen. And I think it'd take something pretty extreme. First step, some quick tests with my very own mini-me swing. That's a big issue. But, I mean, it shows that scaled down about a hundred times, yeah, a guy can push another fella all the way around a swing. What I want to find out is not what will get this to go all the way around, because I know I can stick like a massive rocket on there and it will eventually go all the way around. I want to find out what the minimum requirement is to get it all the way around, because if a person wants to go around on a swing, he doesn't want to go around a hundred times, just the once. What's more, the propulsion system has to be smooth enough that the G-force doesn't break his neck. I figure the best way of getting this round for reliability and variability is a water rocket. Now, I've deliberately got the thrust here coming through the centre of gravity, so this thing won't rock around too much. It should just go straight. I now need to put four atmospheres of air in there. That's like four times atmospheric pressure. And the thrust from that should be enough just enough to send this all the way around. Ah! Yes! Obviously, there's some inherent danger in there still. By the way, he cracked his head on the bar. But it shows that the principle's there, and I'm now satisfied that all these calculations will scale up, and that this is wholly possible on a human scale. The problem is that on a human scale, it's like a hundred times the pressure. It's a hundred times the mass. The force is absolutely gargantuan. To achieve that, I'm building a bigger, more high-tech version of my little prototype. After reams of calculations, a couple of mates and I have spent three weeks putting together our jetpack. To hold the massive 250 atmospheres of pressure required, we're using old, lightweight American Fire Service breathing tanks, loaded with exactly 4.3 litres of water, coming through twin 5.5 millimetre nozzles. I should get precisely the thrust I need. Oh, ouch! I should have seen that coming. Even with a cup full of water in the system, this test literally blew me away. A hefty solid steel workbench is no match for my 240 horsepower jetpack. I'm not sure if anybody really wants to sit on something that can chuck a metal bench across a car park. I can't push that. I know the propulsion system is up to the job. Now it's time to build the framework. With such high pressures involved, we've had to get specialist help with all the piping. Even so, we need to put the whole thing through some serious testing. At this stage, we're not using chains to hang the swing. We're going to test it first with straight bars, because if anything went wrong, 
and those uh, high pressure bottles were to fall on the floor and explode, none of us would be around anymore to find out what happened next. We've added my weight in sandbags and a couple of tons of gas cylinders to hold down the frame. So this is it. Everything's set. Is it going to work? Two, one. Oh. It's all over the place. That frame is going to need a lot more ballast. I mean, it held. Nothing broke. You wouldn't fancy riding it, though. On the one hand, this is brilliant. The jetpack has clearly got enough oomph to get all the way round. But once at speed, there's nothing to stop it. This is now the big problem. At some point, the swing is going to stop rotating, but I can't predict where. If we are going to hang this from chains, what's to stop it crashing down onto the crossbar with disastrous results? Please don't try anything like this. Wow, is all I've got to say about that. Uh, you're not going to want to go anywhere for the next 20 minutes because I guarantee you're going to want to know what happens next. Yes, indeed. Can I point out as well, this lonely little figure with his head in his hands in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen as a swing was going around at the clappers. What was going through your head? <laughs> I think it's for all the, the number crunching and thinking. I'd not seen the forces I've been predicting in real life. and It's twisting steel, it's chucking gas bottles. It was awful. Scary stuff. And it all came from a question on the roadshow. Somebody asked, did we think that anybody would really gone all the way around on a swing. And I figure that sometimes there's a limit to how far you should go to answer a question. And sometimes there isn't. So you haven't reached your limit? Wait and see. <laughs> We've been talking about this question for months now. This has been on our mind for yeah. months. OK, all will be revealed at the end of the show. It's called ramping up the tension for you. Don't go anywhere. I love it. Right, next up, something that affects a lot of us here in the UK. In fact, one in seven people have problems conceiving. So for them, IVF, or in vitro fertilisation, offers very real hope. Now, the technology's been around for about 30 years, but only last year, Dr Robert Edwards, the pioneer of IVF, was offered a new Nobel Prize for his work. In 1978, the first ever IVF baby, Louise Brown, was conceived in this very incubator. Since her birth, four million IVF babies have followed in her footsteps. This groundbreaking science isn't without controversy. For some, it raises ethical questions about creating new life. But for couples desperate to conceive, it is a lifeline. Couples like Hannah and Stuart, who are about to start their first round of IVF. So guys, how are you feeling this morning? Excited? Ner uh, nervous and excited yeah. at the same time. Morning, Hannah. Hello. Hello, lovely Hello. lady. Hi. Under local anaesthetic, Hannah is settled in by Dr. Matthews and his medical team. This is the crucial egg collection stage of the IVF process. And basically, Hannah has been taking lots of hormones that have induced all her follicles to develop fully to the stage where they each hopefully produce an egg. Those big black holes, each one is a follicle. Normally in your regular cycle, you're only developing one follicle to produce one egg per month. Now, it looks like Hannah had 10 or 11 fully developed follicles, and Dr. Matthews is now extracting all the fluid from those follicles, and hopefully within that fluid, there'll be quite a lot of eggs. Dr. Matthews continues to fill the test tubes, and next door in the lab, embryologist Adam Burney is counting the eggs in each one. Finding the eggs has to happen fast to make sure everything is kept at a constant 37 degrees, the temperature inside your body. Yep, it's another egg. Another egg? It's quite a moving thing to watch it in action, to watch the needle enter a full follicle and then drain it of its liquid. While Hannah recovers, Adam is checking the final egg count. Yep, 10 it is. Good going, eh? Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's about, that's about the average number of eggs we collect per patient. So, uh, yeah, spot on, really, yeah. With the eggs checked and counted, it's time for Stuart's sperm to undergo their own health check. How well they do will help determine the method used for fertilisation. So with every sperm sample, what exactly is it that you're looking for? OK, well, two main things. Um, the first one is the number of sperm in the sample. Uh, and the second one is the motility of the sperm. That is how, 
how well the sperm is moving and how well it's moving in a forward direction. Dependent on the count and the motility, we will decide whether to inject a single sperm into each egg or we will just surround each egg with a known concentration of sperm and hopefully the fertilisation will take place uh, naturally in a, in a culture. Oh, OK, interesting. So well, let's have a look at Stuart's sample. Yeah, it looks good. I mean, there's lots of sperm down here, mainly moving very quickly in a forward direction, which Brilliant. is what you want to see, if you want to have a look. Yes, please. Oh, wow, no, they look great. Yes, I mean, Loads that's what I call a good sample. Which sort of brings to my mind the question, you know, Hannah's eggs seemed pretty good. She produced 10 eggs, she's 30 years old. His per motility and number is really good. Yeah. Even now, with the, the sperm quality looking good and the eggs appearing normal, we don't know what's going to happen when we put the eggs with the sperm. You can't tell, until it actually happens, how many might fertilise. The next step is to prepare the sperm and the eggs for the all-important fertilisation. So this is the stage where you are actually going to place Stuart's sperm surrounding the Anna's egg, yeah? That's right, yeah. We make up um, drops in this dish with a known concentration of sperm. I've got slight butterflies because you're just about to, you know, make yeah, I mean, life, hopefully. Yeah, this is one of the most important moments, I guess, when you add the, add the sperm to the eggs. And that's it. That's it. And now the uh, eggs go back in the incubator overnight. And hopefully, if they fertilise, we'll see that first thing in the morning tomorrow. So, potentially, ten babies right yeah, there. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Good luck! And now, it's a waiting game to see if any of Hannah's eggs become embryos. But in some cases, fertilisation needs more of a helping hand. Kelly and Daryl are on their second round of IVF, and after one failed attempt, Adam is using a technique known as ICSI to improve the chances of conception. So ICSI, so what does ICSI stand for again? Right, ICSI is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Basically it does what it says on the tin, right? You're basically injecting the sperm into the cytoplasm of the egg? Exactly, yeah, one single sperm, yes. This is when the father's sperm isn't, isn't as motile. Yeah, is usually right? there's either a very low sperm count or the motility is not good or right. a, a patient has previously had treatment and not fertilised, even with what appears a good sperm sample. Before we inject the sperm, we have to do something called immobilising it. What do you do? OK, what I do with this needle is strike over the top of the sperm like so. You are killing, you just whacked it on the head? Yep, yep, more or less, yep. The sperm is still alive, but it just can't go anywhere. So I now take it into the needle. So it, you don't need it to be motile anymore, you just want nope. it, so that's why you give it a bit of a thump. Yeah, you don't want it to be motile anymore. You want to be able to place the sperm into the egg and it to just sit there. That's just incredible, oh my gosh, so here you go. Okay, what we're gonna do now, oh the sperm's right at the tip of the needle. Yeah. We're gonna go through the zona and through the ulema, which is quite a stretchy membrane surrounding the cytoplasm. There it is. Apply a bit of suction to make sure it's that membrane backwards, is broken. Yeah. And then re-inject sperm with any there cytoplasm. It, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. That is just the most amazing thing I've ever seen, to think that that just there is potentially the beginning of a brand new life. Incredible. So, Adam, that's it. Job done. Yep. Hopefully fertilised eggs are incubating nicely in there. And then tomorrow, what do you look for? OK, when we come in in the morning, what we'll be looking for is the signs of fertilisation. Then what you should see is a male and female nucleus. But there's some bad news on day two. None of Hannah's eggs have been fertilised. She and Stuart will now have to wait six months before starting the process all over again. For Kelly and Daryl, though, things are looking brighter. The eggs fertilise to become embryos and after five days can be implanted into Kelly's womb. They'll still have a tense few weeks ahead of them as the embryo's development is closely monitored. There's lots of hurdles along the way and even when you've got good embryos, those embryos still have to implant. So there are lots of factors after growing good quality embryos that still influence whether the patient will get pregnant and you know, go to term or not.
I've heard of IVF so many times, but I have never seen those pictures before. Aww. And it gave me goosebumps to see the start of life. I what I don't understand is why aren't Hannah and Stuart conceiving, given it all seems to be fine for them in terms of healthy eggs, healthy sperm? I know, it's a big problem. It's one of the unknowns, and they're not alone. Six percent of couples have that very problem. To me, it's another reminder of the beautiful complexity of living systems and what we still have to understand. Now, Hannah and Stuart are going to get ICSI the next round, That's though. The, injecting the sperm. Exactly. But Darren and Kelly, who had the ICSI in that film, are now pregnant, which is really good news. So congratulations to you guys. The main thing I found really interesting is that in 30 years of improved equipment, improved technology, the success rates for IVF simply have not gone up, which is fascinating. And the, the main issue is the implantation, okay? So scientists look at embryos, they wait to see whether they're dividing, multiplying, growing properly. But the longer they wait to implant that embryo, the less chance it has of implanting and taking properly in the womb. But scientists in Stanford have been researching embryos. Take a look at this. This is a microscopic time-lapse photography of developing embryos, right? Yeah. And what they found out is that there are certain cell divisions which need to happen within very strict time windows, all right? So with that knowledge, they can now predict which of those young embryos would develop nicely to the next stage with an accuracy of about 93%. So now they can implant those embryos sooner into the womb, increasing the chances of pregnancy. So overall, the success rates of IVF would go up to 50 to 75%, which is really huge. Now, these are just the trial stages, but it's looking really Good. That's a really, really big leap, isn't it? it okay, is, that yeah. is good news. I've just had a thought, though. What? Did anyone tell Dr. Yan we're moving? I did send him an email, but it bounced back, so... I have not seen him for weeks. Which means he's out there wowing the general population with his vast wisdom, insight and intellect. So, um, all I'd like you to do, actually, is pass me that sweet. Pass me the sweet? Yeah. Pass the sweet. I'm going to have the sweet <laughs> now. No, that's all right, go on. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like that. Have a go, do it. Have a go. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> have a little go. Little go. Little that is. Oh. Yeah. It's a real sweet. <laughs> it's a real sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it like that? It's an optical illusion. Have a look right inside. Yeah. There's because a light in there. No, no, there's nothing. There's no lights in there. What's going on is that when we see something like this sweet, then what we're seeing is light rays bouncing off the surface of the yeah. object and they're collected by our eyes. Mm -hmm. So all we need to do to make this suite look like it's somewhere else mm -hmm. is to make those same light rays come from a different place. OK, does that make sense? So how do you think we do that? <laughs> mirrors. Very good, yeah, mirrors, exactly. But not just any old mirrors, very special mirrors. Let me show you, because under here, you can see what they're like. So here, you see, mirrors, yeah? So it's just like a satellite dish, and the reason that a satellite dish is this shape is because um, it collects radio waves from a distant satellite, okay? And those waves come in parallel to each other, but they bounce off the back, this dish shape, and that's designed to focus the waves together to a single point at the front here. It's called the focal point, okay? So we got these special dish-shaped mirrors, okay? Parabolic mirrors, they're called. That's the important thing, that there's two of these special dish-shaped, satellite dish-shaped mirrors. It's probably easier to show you with this cross-section that I've got here. So if you come around, I can show you how light bounces around inside. So imagine that that's the bottom, so like the suites like that, and that's the top where you're looking through, okay? So you can see that any light that comes off a point on the surface of the suite bounces around, it's reflected off the top, comes down in parallel, reflected back up, and comes to the same point. Yeah. And no matter how I move it, it comes through the same point at the top, OK? And for each point on the surface of, of the suite at the bottom, it makes another point on the top that's exactly the same. Wow. Yeah. And so, of course, when you see this here, it looks like an exact replica of the suite because the light's coming off every point just as it did in the same way for the suite that's down the bottom. And that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well done. I'm not impressed. It's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Anyone fancy a sweet? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real one. <laughs> it's all right, I'll eat it later. <laughs> now time to return to the enduring conundrum of the 360 swing. I can't tell you how much science, maths and engineering has gone into getting this far. But 
I now feel it's less of a question of will it work and more one of is there a survivable way of stopping it? So, a catch mechanism. I have given this so much thought. I've thought about parachutes, I've thought about drag nets, I've thought about bungee, I've thought about circus catch nets, I've thought about absolutely everything and I feel as though none of them will do it. Because over the distances that those sort of systems work on, the forces would be absolutely huge, possibly too much for a person to handle. So I need to come up with something that acts for as long a period of time to keep that braking force to a minimum. I've decided to go for a rotating catch net. So what should happen is the rider will get jetted round as before, maintaining straight chains, land in the catch net, the friction on here will be what sucks the energy out, breaking his ball back up to there and then drop back down, hopefully still smiling. Three, two, one. It wasn't pleasant, but it couldn't have looked more survivable. It did exactly as it was supposed to do. So now I just need to do the same thing, but on a human scale. We're attaching a set of drum brakes from an old trailer to the crossbar of the swing frame. Fixed to them are bars holding a piece of netting. I opted for the stuff that goes around the outside of garden trampolines. The brakes can be adjusted so they absorb a specific force. I need them to stop the swing, fully loaded, at exactly the right point, because I want it to go around once and once only. 60, 70, 70. Right, now we're hanging the swing from real chains, not solid bars. This is the test. Time to bring out our proper crash test dummy. He's exactly my weight, 75 kilos. Three, two, one. It's a disaster. So near, but yet so far. Suddenly, what promised to be a perfect 10 has crashed in at a miserable zero. If this had been a real person, I'd be calling an ambulance, or maybe an undertaker. It's the netting that let us down. I figured it needs reinforcing, but with minimal extra weight. And I've worked out it needs to be set at a slightly different angle. Looks like success, or so I thought. I've seen something that looks survivable, but it also looks a bit like a car crash. Look closely at where the dummy's legs and feet hit the braking net. His shins, just down above his ankle, were banging into the, uh, the bar that, at the bottom that keeps the net taut. So we're going to adjust the seating position and, uh, and see if that can pull the legs in sufficiently. Three, two, one. Wow. Perfection, and the first of a bunch of successful tests. The high pressure system's firing perfectly. The braking net is spot on. All those calculations and predictions are proving accurate. And our crash test dummy is still in one piece. At least, he's not complaining. There is only one thing left to do. Move over dummy. Time to put my convictions to the test and myself in the hot seat. It might seem insane, but my calculations predict I should survive the forces involved. But please, don't try anything like this. Pretty much like that. It's been a massive investigation to answer a question from a viewer on last year's Roadshow. And now, finally, it could be solved in the blink of an eye. Ho, 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 ho.
<laughs> yes. Jim Milner, man. Oh, my friend. I never want to press a button like that again. Oh, my God. <laughs> as though it is possible for a person to go all the way around on a swing. <laughs> you have seriously just raised the bar and then gone round the bar <laughs> you just raised. Absolutely. Our superhero wow. is well and truly back in the room. Well done, you. Awesome. Well, I mean, sometimes even I'm shocked at the level of faith I'll put in my own understanding <laughs> of science and engineering. It's, it's just wrong. It works, though. <laughs> it works. And we're going to leave you with something a little bit extra special tonight. We're going to end bang as you've never heard it before, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the symphony of Bang. See you next week. Goodbye. That is amazing. That really demonstrates the speed of sound perfectly. Exactly. Let me do it again. Three, two, one. Welcome to Bang Goes the Theory. The show that likes to take science apart, give it a bit of a poke, and put it all back together again. Put it all back together. What I want to do is make that bigger, faster, stronger, and humbler, more powerful. Something that requires a shocking disregard for personal safety. I'm aiming to accelerate to almost the speed of light. When I get there, things will seem pretty normal to me. One of the most tantalizing questions we can ever ask. The big question is, why is he doing this? This actually illustrates. One of the most fundamental laws of the universe. The more questions you answer, the more you find there is to investigate. And the more questions you pose, and that's the beauty of science. Welcome to the quietest room in the world.